Thank you, Poncho Man. Welcome, everybody. Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. My name is Bob Babbitt. We are brought to you by Quintana Roo, Form Smart Swim Goggles, Master Spas, Clash Endurance, Premium Plus Sports, and of course, our Challenged Athletes Foundation. Our next guest, we're going to talk a little training. He is a coach of the number one and number two ranked triathletes on the planet. Olaf Alexander Boo joins us from his palatial vehicle <laughs> somewhere in Norway. <laughs> Olaf, how are you? Thanks. Good. Uh, yeah, just uh, driving from the west to the east coast uh, for uh, some family gathering this weekend because it's uh, tomorrow is an uh, official holiday in Norway and then we just take also Friday off and uh, yeah, so very good. And you? We're wonderful. And so uh, when we think about triathlon, Norway is not usually the country that people think about. Over the years, it was the U.S., it was Germany, it was Canada, uh, Switzerland, and you guys have made a huge impact with, you know, uh, uh, Christian Blumenfeld, the Olympic gold, just won the Ironman World Championship, or Gustav Eden, he's won the last two 70.3 World Championships, won his first Ironman uh, when he, uh, last year. So talk about just when you got involved, because it sounds like from talking to Christian, this was something that goes back to 2009, 2010. By 2020, Norway will win a gold medal. That became sort of a, 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 a mandate. When did you get involved and, and how did you turn the training around? Uh, so I got involved in uh, 2015. Uh, um, Orion, or Dr. Orion Matson, he was then the coach from the Olympic Federation for the Triathlon Federation and Arl Twetten. And uh, me and Orion had been working separately together uh, in, in physiology and, and uh, and uh, training but in and also at the same time he was also the coach for uh, for the triathlon federation or let's say the olympic group in 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 uh, in triathlon yes. uh, in norway and and he asked me uh, or said to me in 2015 you should uh, come on board and, and start helping uh, helping these guys um yeah, and uh, that's where it started. Uh, so uh, the first thing uh, I think uh, now, uh, quite uh, or which has been maybe famously dubbed the Norwegian method, it's uh, primarily about intensity control. But from there on, we added also a lot of other stuff as well as we we, we went on. What's interesting, if you look back at sort of the history of training. Uh, I remember well with, with the Kenyans, what they do is they train at altitude and they train as groups. And years ago, when the U.S. decided that, you know, we were going backwards in, in marathon running or actually in running, what what they do? They went up to a place called Mammoth, California, they trained at altitude. And next thing you know, Mev Kofleski won a silver medal in the marathon and Dina Castor won a bronze. So training in groups, training at altitude, that's obviously something that you guys do up in Sierra Nevada. You guys are training up at altitude and training with great athletes together. But you've added some of your some other things along the way what 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 besides just training at altitude and training in groups have you guys added to the equation uh, so i think uh, uh, training in groups uh, that's something that rl rl basically uh, was responsible for uh, all the way back from the beginning he uh, there was people of course involved before uh, rl also with building the national team but uh, i would say that the national team that we have today is something that has been put together by by RL. He he found the uh, uh, or has been part of finding at least the, the new athletes. Some of them was there already before RL came in. So I think Christian was in the Triathlon Federation just before RL came in, and, and a few others. But mainly from there and building it to the team it is today, and and so that's uh, RL's uh, uh, work. And of course, also in the beginning and for a very long time, he was also the coach uh, uh, for all these athletes. In, in addition to being the being the sports director and building the, uh, yeah. The, the, the sports 
part of it. My goal when I came in into the team in 2015 was more to see what then leading into 2016 Rio Olympics to see basically what can what can we do better from from going into 2006 Rio Olympics and then into Tokyo Olympics. So in in 2015 my role was basically to just observe. So I was spending nine months I think it was plus minus um uh just observing uh and because i came from a techno uh, technology background as an, an engineer or f- physics yes. then um then uh but was privately tutored by dr Orion matson in the olympic federation in physiology of course my key strength was to bring the let's say the applied applied physiology together with technology and see how we could even more accurately understand how different intervention work, how the training work for each individual. So uh, group and all the uh, everything that goes into the group and and and, and building the team that was uh, something that RL already had put into place. And for me, then it was to start to optimize, optimize on that and start to individualize the training moving on. So obviously, first thing already mentioned, intensity control and uh, using lactate and these kind of things was the was what I brought in. Uh, more structured testing and then we built on to more uh, uh, the altitude uh, altitude program heat program time accl- time accl- uh, or time zone acclimatization program mm-hmm. uh, where we use a lot of technology and then especially also then starting to work very close with tech partners but basically all the preparations that went into uh, into the olympics then was a part of the thing that I started on working on. And some of them are more the basic things like nailing the intensity and you can come back to why that's very important because it's something that is so easy to forget why. And uh, ultimately it was doing the final adjustments on the suits and making the uh, infamous uh, Norwegian cockpit for our, for our, for our triathletes where I first made a design and the concept for it. And then I found a Dutch company that uh, were able to put it into production and, and, and make sure that we had it when uh, going on to the fin- to, yeah, to the start line and all the way to the finish line. So, so it, 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 it's actually so many projects and some of them are so extreme also when it comes to the science part of it, where we're using uh, isotope tracing, uh, both when it comes to nutrition and, and, and cal- uh, energy turnover and so on, that it's, uh, it, it's, I think it's difficult to understand sometimes uh, all the stuff that uh, have gone into all this uh, just out of pure passion. So when I look at, at Christian winning the gold, and obviously knowing it was going to be hot, knowing you've got a great runner there at Alec Yee, and knowing that you know Christian doesn't want to come out down to the last 100 yards. <laughs> so he, he wants to get away early. So was that part of the training leading in? Okay, we've got to be ready to go 1K out. You're, you're going to have to go because that, that was one of the gutty, gutsiest moves I've seen, someone making a move that early in the Olympic Games going uh, with 1K to go in that heat. That was, wasn't surprising, but it was, I'm sure it took Alex by surprise. Yes, I think I think actually the the Olympics, uh, because of the climate and um, let's say the dynamics of an Olympic race, uh, the win that we we took in the Olympics. Um, um, of course, it's it, there, there. There was a lot of excitement and 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 and. Um, yeah, I would yeah maybe excitement around of course the Olympics because it only happens every four years so this is right. something super special it's something we put we have invested more than four years we actually invested five years into now because it was postponed one year mm-hmm. uh, to 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 do whatever we could uh, to be uh, best position to to take the gold um, but and and a big part of it is actually learning to know yourself and we built up uh, test protocols and other things not necessarily just for the sake of doing a test or these kind of things but equally much to learn to know your own strengths and weaknesses and then to work on your weaknesses but also to to know really your strengths and i think that that's what actually christian really proved on the one side we had a superior heat program 
heat, heat acclimatization and heat training program. And I think I think still we do uh, have an advantage there, showing that what we were capable of doing in Cozumel, which is actually hotter than, or actually had climates that was hotter than, than Kona, uh, both in terms of humidity and temperature. Um, but I think, I think that for me, one of the things where maybe really Christian's uh, knowledge about himself, knowing himself so well from all the testing and, and, and pushing himself so much was actually the world championship because he was also the first in history to take the also the uh, short distance world championship uh, gold also in the same year as the Olympic gold medal. Right. So the thing that was really impressive there was that, of course, first of all, he came out of the water, uh, I think it was down almost 30 seconds, so more or less the same as the Olympics. But the group that came up in the front, uh, they, this was Martin van Riel, uh, I think, and Vincent Lewis, and uh, I'm so bad with names. I don't, uh, I, th I think there was one more. And the thing is that they decided just to work together like a, team time trial to, right. to open up because they knew that if they could bring Martin from real first of the finish line and Christian came fourth, then actually Martin would also win uh, the world championship uh, series uh, gold right. as well. So what Christian does here, the last lap of the... Oops. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. This, this is the thing with automated cars. Suddenly it just decided that it's going to power saving motors here. So it just changed the, changed the settings. <laughs> no, so, so, so the thing... So the thing is that uh, the thing is that uh, 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 Christian, when he came out on the run there, he actually what maybe you couldn't see from the outside because that seemed like a, 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 a sprint finish. Mm -hmm. But Christian actually, because he knew how strong he was, he just knew that he he couldn't let it be up to a, a uh, to a sprint finish because I think it was Martin van Riel and. Pierre Lecour and himself that was uh, uh, running together. And he, he knew that if he came uh, close to the finish line, uh, where they had been running a little bit tactical and they right. would, uh, would end up with a sprint, they would probably have been able to, to, to go get that a little bit extra top speed that Christian right. wouldn't have. But th this because of this, Christian decided that he would go hard, all actually all the way from the start, and he would go so hard that the guys actually would be empty or not be able to mobilize when they come towards the finish line. And then Christian was in the best position that the little extra top spin he could find that was just, just out of sheer capacity while the others had been running maybe over the limits and not having that possibility to mobilize the last part. Uh, so certainly certainly knowing yourself and, and building up the protocols and, and other things that allow you to experiment and push you maybe a little bit further than what you're used to, to get to know that, okay, what am I actually good for? How many times can I remobilize? How hard can I actually go and still still keep it all the way there and putting this together in the training there i think uh, yeah christian and gustav caspar uh, and so on are and now we have more at least two but they are they are really smart uh, and, and eager to learn they don't they don't only train to train but they actually they like to to experiment and, and see yeah what, what are what are the strengths and weaknesses and, and, and working on it so when you're you're transitioning from olympic distance to the Ironman. It's like all of a sudden you're going from being a 1500 meter runner to doing a marathon. <laughs> and obviously the science is different. The technology is so much different. And for Christian to go from winning a gold to basically uh, winning the, the Ironman world championship within a 12 month period is, is, is pretty amazing. Uh, how did you have to adapt from Olympic to the longer and still high. It's it's not like people are going slower for that long distance racing. You had you know Cam Worth coming off of Paris Roubaix, leading his team at Paris Roubaix, and he didn't really bridge up to the, up to the guys during that bike ride. So those guys, everybody's riding and running and swimming as hard as they can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think. Uh, um, Actually, it's just from a pure physiological or metabolic perspective, there is a much bigger difference actually between a 15 meter, 1500 meter runner and a marathon runner. And that is that the, the shorter the event becomes, the, the bigger the change actually is in, 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 in let's say, uh, 
uh, in your metabolic profile. The longer the distance become when you typically get out to a marathon, or like, which is actually the same, more or less the same duration as an uh, Olympic uh, short course triathlon right. race, if you think of it in duration wise. The, yeah. the, 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 big, the biggest difference actually from going from an Olympic distance to, uh, uh, to an Ironman, for example, is that there are some other... In Olympic racing, you could say that having a high view to max, having a high, something we call in, 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 in physiology, uh, high fractional utilization of oxygen. Um, so meaning basically that you, you can go at a very high percentage over a long duration of your view to max. So very high percentage of that. Uh, that are characteristics that are, that are very important in an Olympic triathlon because the speed is so high uh, and they're pushing so hard. In uh, in um, and then of course there is one parameter where we often not talk very much about or people forget and that is uh, something I or th that we call capacity and very often people confuse capacity for being let's say your air your your VO two max and uh, and so but that's actually not capacity capacity that's a dimension that we very often not test and that's the time to exhaustion so to give an example you can have two guys with the same FTP, for example, but one guy can sit at his FTP for 30 minutes, another one can sit at his FTP for 90 minutes. And that's where basically the capacity metric comes in. So you can have two guys, for example, having the same VO2 max. So let's say they have, uh, both of them have 80 milliliters per minute per kilogram in mm -hmm. oxygen uptake. But one, one guy can hold that for three minutes before he reaches exhaustion. Another guy can hold that for six minutes before he reaches exhaustion. And that's, that's a, that's a, massive difference in right. in capacity so now now for example when you race in 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 uh, in uh, uh olympic or short course race mm -hmm. norm with good pacing with good pacing you can actually do that even almost without taking any in any nutrition Right. On uh, Olympic distance, that, then, then nutrition starts to become important and carbohydrates obviously being very important to take in. On, on half Ironman and especially on an Ironman, actually the limitation is not anymore your view to max. So one of the things that we see in order for an athlete to be as fast as possible for an Ironman is that you don't want to have the highest possible view to max. And the reason for that also is because the heart is grossly inefficient. The heart is extremely inefficient actually and just using a lot of energy to, to do work. And the thing is that you, you, you're you never going to raise close to your view to max in Ironman. So obviously now to optimize efficiency and all these kind of things in order to get go faster, for, for the same amount of carbohydrates or where, or, and where carbohydrates are very important, actually your carb max or how fast you can, or how fast you can basically take up carbohydrates and how much carbohydrates you have in your body is actually going to be the limitation to the speed in, in an Ironman as long as you have a decent level of VO2 max uh, uh, and also fractional utilization of oxygen uh, in, in, in an Ironman. So it's, it's the biggest change actually is that you... Uh, is more the ability to turn over carbohydrates fast enough and making sure you just have big enough engine. Uh, if you have a too big engine, you'll actually, it's actually inefficient uh, for a triathlete. So this is one of the biggest changes we did, we did with Christian. And one of the biggest things we also documented because we are testing quite regularly, for example, the VU to max and so. So we went down quite significantly on his VU to max. I'm not going to say the numbers now that I'll keep for a secret for a little bit shorter while. Before, <laughs> and then, 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 then we can talk about it maybe after Kona. Or, okay. or I just have the corner we can talk about it, but we had to reduce the the, the view to max, and we also had uh, his his maximum active steady state or FTP also came down a little bit in order for him to be faster at the race pace going into an, going into an Ironman. Um, it's very easy to think that you need the highest possible FTP going into an Ironman, but we found that that's actually not the case because it's not sustainable from an idea idealized perspective or where 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 uh, where you could you had no limitation how many how many hours of training you could do and these kind of things maybe it would be possible to go higher and still race faster but this is the main limitation and Christian is already bringing in home uh, 30 35 hours a week of training and then it's tough to get in more training and still being able to recover 
uh, sufficiently uh, in order to nail the key sessions during our week. So it's, uh, but we are still noobs, but we are advancing fast with the science. <laughs> so it's like, it, when when people make that transition from short distance to long distance, usually they bring that speed over. But then there's always a tendency of, okay, now I'm an Ironman guy. So I'm just going to do long training and you lose speed. Now he's planning to go from doing one Ironman last year to winning Ironman World Championship, going sub seven, and then coming back, you know, doing Kona. And obviously there'll be other races in between. How do you maintain the speed when you're, the focus is all is Ironman. So, of course, the, my, one of my biggest worries when, we, when the guys uh, wanted to do an Ironman was that the main goal, the bigger goal, was anyway to go back to Paris 2024. And if we look at the statistics, we actually have no male triathlete that have gone from Olympic distance on the podium to Ironman at the podium and then back actually on the podium in, in yeah. Olympic distance. Actually, I think the only athlete that ever have been able to do that, and I might be mistaken now, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, please have me excused about if so, but I think I heard that Nicola Spirig is maybe the only athlete that did actually come back at the podium after being racing uh, Ironman. I don't know how well she did in Ironman. She did might have I, done one. Yeah, I think maybe she went and did one Ironman and then came yeah. back, yeah. But yeah. yeah. So. But but that's also I think that one that's fine. But doing seven ones, that's where you are. Where we are afraid yes. that things will happen. And we on that also we are doing quite heavy research too, where we are measuring over two thousand blood markers and proteins using special techniques. So looking at the mRNA and looking at the using proteomics, uh, proteomics. Um, uh, to because we don't know we don't know why this is happening, uh, but. In order, what we do is then also to, because Paris is such an important goal for us, is that we are actually, um, since we're also measuring what is happening. So we went, we have numbers before the Olympics, we have numbers straight after the Olympics. So we know what an Olympic champion looks like in terms, mm -hmm. let's say from a scientific perspective. Yes. And that, that, that gives us that guide at least for, okay, this is what it looks like more or less when we try to quantify as much as possible from metabolic profiles to blood markers to uh, even more invasive uh, measurements but uh, the thing is that uh, what, what the way i normally work is that for example then going into cosmel we use a lot of testing and these kind of things just to see okay how are things coming towards where we want it to be or what we think is needed to to win in cosmel and maybe even break the record uh, and then uh, because we saw there was such a huge change physiological change away from the characteristics that we we know are important in olympic we decided we we wanted to bring in a new block again and see how close we could get back to olympic level uh in that block before we started to specialize towards uh specialize towards um saint george and in this block when we started to specialize more for olympic distance racing we actually saw that they came back up to the same level at least in most of the disciplines and some of the disciplines they actually went above the level they had in the olympics which oh. was a really good let's say good uh, confirmation that we okay fine we can tune it back again then we went into St. George, of course, a uh, little bit unlucky with conditions and for Gustav and so, but uh, still, uh, I would say, uh, as good wrestlers as we could hope for, 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 for Christian. <laughs> winning, uh, the world, the, yeah. <laughs> winning the world. But now we're actually going back into, because we don't know, is this something, can we, are we able to bridge it back up to the same level that, we, that is required in the, in the Olympics every time after, uh, after an Ironman? Or is it so that we will see a decline because it gets tougher and tougher to get back? So now we're just, we are going into a new block again now where, we'll be, where we, we will be doing more um, uh, Olympic, uh, Olympic uh, oriented training again. Of course, I have I, I, um, metaphor is that you can imagine if you have a if you have a glass of water mm -hmm. and, and a pH of seven, neutral basically, yeah. that represents Olympic level. Now, when you go uh, Ironman distance, let's say you that's 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 uh, equal sized uh, uh, glass of water, but that mm -hmm. has a pH of a pH of eight, or right. let's say nine nine even. So if you mix if you mix these two glasses now, with, so the Olympic champion with 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 Ironman athlete, you get a pH of eight. So pH of eight, what was was what was required to win the world championship. 
the way now, the, the, let's say the, the non-scientific way, but a very practical way to get, bring him back to Olympic distance was now basically pu to pour in infinitive amount of water that has a pH of seven. So you're trying to dilute the higher pH that you had going into the Ironman. So you're trying to dilute it by infinitive amount of water. But of course, this requires an inf infinitive amount to bring it back to seven. Or anyway, you'll end up with 7.000000 and one at the other way. The scientific method would be to exactly understand what is the, what, what, what from a scientific perspective, what does an Olympic champion look like? What does an Ironman champion look like? And then basically to bring him back to Olympic level as fast as possible, instead of adding just infinitive amount of pH seven into the bucket to, to dilute the, the, the consequence, the Ironman training that has a pH of nine had to, to, to win the world. We actually want to find that pH of five, uh, yeah, five, in, no, uh, C, uh, yeah, five instead, uh, and, and pour in, and then basically are back to a P, pH of, of, of seven. Uh, um, or pH of six, and then back to bring it back to a pH of seven. So you, you maybe you have to go even more, even shorter distance oriented training or more high intensity training to bring it faster back to Olympic level. But again, this is work in progress. We, we don't know, but that's why we also use all the science to understand how can we, how can we, we induce these changes that we think is needed to win uh, faster than just doing a lot of, like you say, for example, specialization, doing the long, long, slow distance mm -hmm. uh, training to, to, to see if that works. Yeah. Well, so you, you come off this last Olympics and you get what first eighth and 11th, right. With, with your Norwegians. And then, uh, so the plan is to go back to the Paris because it's only two years away. Right. We're 2024 is right around the corner. So absolutely. Wow. And do you have, Besides Casper and Gustav and Christian, do you have some other athletes that are moving up the ranks as well? Uh, so, uh, yes, absolutely. We got uh, Vettler, uh, Vettler Torm. Uh, so he is one of the new uh, really uh, strong athletes, uh, very strong on, the, let's say, the sprint and, and shorter distances. Mm -hmm. So building up his capacity to, to become better also at the Olympic distance. Uh, and then we have uh, some new girls in the team. I was going to ask about oh, that because you can't yeah, do yeah, yeah. relay unless you got some women. Yeah, so of course we have Lotte, uh, Lotte uh, Miller, and uh, um, now we also have uh, Solvay uh, Lövset, which is uh, a very impressive uh, woman. She is uh, a powerhouse, uh, a little bit slow to swim, but that's getting better. But she is a powerhouse. She can be. Re she can be, become really fast, I think, in 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 in, uh, in triathlon. And then we also have another athlete, uh, Stine Dalle, and uh, there are even one more coming into the team now. So we hope, of course, to be in 2024. We want to be in a mixed relay. Last year we just came one place short of qualifying mm -hmm. a mixed relay team uh, for for the Olympics. It was a let's say it was a long shot. We just decided the last year going into the Olympics uh, that since we have one more year now let's just try to see if we can assemble our mixed relay team and qualify them for for the olympics um uh so yes we we have more athletes uh, but the challenge in norway is that we are very few people uh we are only uh five million people in in the whole of norway uh it's a country that is um, um has one of the low or lower Popul uh, population densities in, 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 the, in the world too. So that means also that find, bringing, bringing people together is, is a little bit of a challenge because people are living all over the, all over the, uh, the country. So uh, we, have, we have some, let's say, uh, um, topographic uh, challenges. Uh, but other than, other than that, I think we are, we also then because of that, and because we don't have that much any athletes, we, we just have to be, be very smart at how we work with the athletes because those few athletes that we have, those we really have to take well care of and, and try to maximize the potential in each of them athletes. And that me means also a lot of individualization. Well, and also one of the things that, that you guys have done so well is besides, you know, Gustav getting sick, injury wise, your guys have stayed very, very healthy. And with the workload that you're doing, obviously you have individualized everything to make sure 
that they're, they are staying healthy because you, you don't have this huge pool of athletes to choose from. You've got to keep them healthy. Absolutely. That- Absolutely. And I think that actually comes back down to, the, to that intensity control because one of the things that people don't realize is that when we go out and we do training, uh, we are used, uh, most people in the world today are using extremely simple metrics to quantify, let's say, a focal point in a training to, to, to determine which kind of intensity you're going to do on the different intervals. One thing that we are extremely good at and which is universal is the time. So if you have like, a, let's say you had an interval session that was like four by four, so you had four minutes on, uh, four minutes off, four minutes on, four minutes off, whatever. N- People wouldn't go out and they would do four minutes, 11 seconds on one and, uh, and three minutes and uh, 47 seconds off. And then you do the next one, next one five minutes and, 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 and 11 seconds on and so on. You, you, you would basically nail it. You would be almost on the second when it comes to four minutes on and you would be f- almost on the second four minutes off and you would do this. But the thing is that let's say you are you would you would do this incorrectly. So let's say instead of going four minutes, you went four four and a half minutes. There's a linear relationship between the training load and the additional time you are doing. But the thing is that for, for the intensity, this is where people we, we have so poor, or people are basically managing this in such a poor way. Because the thing is that if you increase your speed, or put it very simple, if you double the speed to put it in more gross perspective, yeah. but if you double, double the speed, that has a quadruple increase in force. So, so second power increase in force. So now you can also imagine that if you just go up a little bit higher in speed because you feel you can push, you can dig, that means basically you're quadrupling the, or, or second power increase in the force that is required to basically manage that a small change in speed. But on top of that, it has a, it, it has a, third power so cube increase also in energetic demand to just go that little bit faster as well and if you don't manage this well then basically that's why people also get injury prone basically because they forget that just going slightly higher in speed has a has an exponential increase in the force that you that you exert your ligaments for your bone everything basically in your body so you get more prone to 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 injury and if you then basically do the testing and you see that well there is no need there is no need for for example for you gustav to go to just push yourself that extra there because that won't make you faster maybe it actually from a metabolic perspective is going to end up making you slower for the distance that you are aiming for then you, you also have, uh, I think it's Gustav or Gustav have said very uh, smart. He basically said that the reason for why they dare to push so uh, and work so much they do and why we stay injury free is because they know exactly where the limit is because of all the testing we do. And I think that's, I think that's, 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 the, um, that's the, the head of the nail more or less. And yeah. Yeah. It's interesting when we were doing the post-race interview with Christian and he was talking about winning at St. George and obviously having that, that great race on a day that he really wasn't feeling that good. <laughs> that, that was, he wins Ironman World Championship, wasn't feeling that good. And he, and he said something during the interview. He said, well, I'm, and the Kona course is way better for me than this course, which every pro out there right now is going, oh my God, he went <laughs> 749. And the but, other course is better because he can maintain power, right? It's the, the thing with St. George, it's up and down and bike handling and all that other stuff. He can just put his head down. You feel that as well, that that course is way better for him. Absolutely. I think, I think that uh, one thing that is also quite interesting is that if we think of our world record in a world championship, the previous actually uh, world record time in a world championship was by Jan Frodeno at Kona, and that was seven hours, 51 minutes. Christian went in St. George, which is a more grueling course, 7.49, so two minutes faster, and that was actually in a more extreme course than the record at Kona. So I think, and I, I, I absolutely agree with Christian, uh, the course actually in St. George, that's typically a course that really favors uh, Gustav, of the two athletes, no question. But uh, but but of course we're gonna make sure. Of course that I'm not favoring Christian or Gustav. So I'm gonna make sure that they are so individualized 
perfectly tuned leading into Kona that it's going to be an excitement uh, to see actually who's going to first of the line. But definitely, I think that the Kona course really also uh, favors Christian because Christian is extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, he carries a little bit more weight than, 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 than Gustav does also. So racing a little bit more flat really favors him. The, the more going straight, not so technical course, these kind of things, that all also is something that I know Christian prefers also. So uh, I think that, uh, yeah, Kona, uh, the right day in Kona, we're going to shave a significant amount of time off the, off the previous record that was, uh, that was set in, 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 in Kona. It, we might, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a new world record time in, in Kona uh, this year, if, uh, if, if uh, conditions and stuff are on our, on our side. Olaf, I, I could chat with you all day long. Uh, <laughs> I know you've got your family out there playing. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully we can do this again as we get closer to Kona because uh, I, I learned, I, I've learned a ton just chatting with you. Thank you for taking so much Thank time. You. You're the coach of the, the number one and two ranked athletes <laughs> on the planet. And five years ago, people had no idea Norway had a triathlon team. So look what you've done. Yeah. You should be very proud of everything you've accomplished. I, I, I want to say that this is this is not a solo project or this is not me only there are so many people behind me which i really want to bring forward and i get the question sometimes why i'm not more on social media and so on and that's basically because i have no interest in i don't find very much pressure in, in posting and making stuff on the social media myself but actually one of the things that i've been thinking of lately is more that i want to bring forward all those amazing people that actually are standing behind me and helping driving this project because this is absolutely nothing or like like a solo project for me there are so many specialists incredibly smart people that actually i want to present because i'm so proud i'm so proud of all the people that also uh, uh are working around me christian gustav uh too that uh you'll you, you you'll hopefully soon start to learn more about this because these are amazing people not only from a professional perspective but also from a from just pure personality so um yeah i love it thank you so much for taking time and thank you for breaking away from your family for a little bit i appreciate that <laughs> olaf alexander boo has been our guest again breakfast with bob not quite kona edition thanks everybody for tuning in we'll catch you next time thank you olaf thank you so much bob appreciate it <laughs> All right.